Well, I want to welcome everybody for this is a great a great turnout for um, for uh, Jackie's talk, which is in the the Iger seminar series for the art uh, dialogue in polar science and engineering. Uh, just a few words about about the program before we start. The Iger is an NSF National Science Foundation uh, funded program that we have here at Dartmouth to um, break new frontiers in graduate. Um, education for scientists and engineers. So we have several cohorts of students now who have done work in polar science and engineering, um, and this this uh, seminar series is, is part of that. It's also sponsored by the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth, and uh, which is under the Dickey Center for International Understanding. So it gives me um, pleasure today to introduce Jackie Jackie Richter Mangi. Jackie is a research civil engineer at Krell. She has uh, her graduate degrees from the uh, University of Delaware in civil engineering, and I'd just like to take a moment to say, if you think it's odd for an engineer to be studying climate and polar science and relevant issues, think ahead. Again, this is the future of engineering. Um, Jackie is the, uh, has been funded by a number of agencies for leadership roles in many different programs. The uh, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, um, has her as the lead on the Arctic Report Card, which is an uh, annual report that discusses the state of the, Ar the, state of the Arctic in many different aspects. Um, NOAA um, has, has her as the scientific lead on the um, uh, sea ice team for their ice bridge program, looking at um, changes in, in the ice from satellite imagery. Uh, CISEC, which is the U.S. Arctic Submarine Program uh, research area, has her as chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee. So she spans DOD, NOAA, NASA, NSF, quite a talent. In addition to that, or in, in, in her path leading to that, she spent many, many years studying sea ice in the Arctic. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Jackie Richter Mengi. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Mary and I were joking about going to the Arctic so much and wondering whether that helps preserve us or not. I don't know. I'm starting to get wrinkles anyway. Um, I wanted to say thank you to the uh, Dickey Center and the Institute of Arctic Studies for inviting me to participate in this seminar series, which as was mentioned is a dialogue in polar science and society. And I am really pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you about my research today, some of my current research, but I think even more importantly to explain to you why I feel very comfortable and confident in saying that the Arctic is ground zero in a warming climate. Now, I, I really want to embrace the fact that this is a dialogue and not a lecture, so for the next hour or so, I really hope that I'll be talking with and to you rather than at you. It's kind of late in the day, so a little bit of conversation is a good thing. So I would really urge you, if you have a question along the way, please raise your hand and ask. Uh, if you have the question, I guarantee you that there's other people in the room that have the same question, and it's easier to clarify the point that I'm making along the way rather than waiting till the very end. Of course, if you have a deluge of questions, we may have to change that plan, but uh, hopefully that will work. Um, also, uh, since it is a dialogue, it will help me a little bit to know my audience. Um, so one of the questions that I have, how many of you are students in the iGroup program? Wow, okay. So you probably, last week, did Don Perovich give his lectures on sea ice? Okay, great. Super. That means that I can call on you guys to help explain <laughs> some certain points. So that'll be great to hear. You'll be hearing some familiar things, but from a different perspective. And, uh, repetitiveness is not bad. I don't think it helps uh, make sure that those lessons are well learned. Uh, is there anybody in here who's been at any of my Iliad classes? Nope. Okay, I've taught some at the Dartmouth uh, Iliad, and I was wondering if anybody would be here uh, from that. Um, those, uh, so no quizzes, no, no folks that I'd be able to quiz uh, there, from there. Um, I wanted to start today by using this slide, not just as a title slide, but for those of you who have not been out on the Arctic sea ice cover, how many of you have been out on the Arctic sea ice cover? Okay, a few people, great. Those that have not, which is the vast majority of you, this is what it looks like to be out on the Arctic sea ice cover in the wintertime. This is a shot that was taken in March. 
And what it helps do is dispel a common misunderstanding about the Arctic sea ice cover. A lot of people think about the Arctic sea ice cover as being this uniform piece of ice that just kind of plunk sits there on top of the Arctic Ocean. Absolutely not the case. It's an extremely dynamic ice cover. It responds to winds blowing across the top surface and to ocean currents pulling along its bottom surface. When the forces are just right, that ice sheet can break apart and look like a shattered plate of glass. It'll expose ocean. That ocean will freeze back in the wintertime. Winds will shift around. The ice cover will come back together and form ridges, and in this particular case, a rubble field. And you can see when you read books about polar explorers, inevitably in there you will hear them bemoan the nature of the Arctic sea ice cover because of these things like rubble fields. Just imagine that you're pulling a sled and you're facing this. It's a mess, I guarantee you. Um, and not only do you have to get on top of this, but you have to figure out what direction you're going. Yep. What's the scale of the rubble? The scale of the rubble is, this rubble is probably about this high. So a couple meters high. Um, and it's an easy place to break a leg real, or twist an ankle because you're walking along, it's snow filled, you don't see it, it's not packed well, and bam, down you go. One thing you learn about when you're walking on ridges is to get this reaction quickly. You start going down, spread out this way so you don't fall down through it. So anyway, so this gives you a sense of what it's like to be out on the Arctic sea ice cover. And um, at the end of this presentation, if we have time and you have interest, I tacked on some pictures of what it's like to be out in an ice camp where I do a lot of my work. So uh, like I said, if we have time, I'll be happy to show you what it's like to do work out there. So figuring that it is late in the day, I figured it was good to tell you the key points, the key things that I hope that you will leave this talk uh, knowing. First off, the Arctic region provides strong observational evidence of a warming climate. This is why I really like my job. I take measurements, in, measurements about the Arctic sea ice cover. I do not do models. I provide information to modelers. The nice thing about the observations that I'm going to show you is they provide very hard evidence about the fact that the climate is warming. Modelers, they have a harder job. They're basically trying to come up with a model that represents a um, process. And when they do that, they have to make algorithms and everybody will question the quality of those algorithms. I avoid that whole thing by doing observations. Plus, going out to the ice cover is the best part of my work. I can't imagine just sitting in front of a uh, screen all day. Secondly, the projections are, okay, we'll go back to models immediately. All the models that you look at, they vary in their details, but one thing is consistent in the models that you see about the projection of the climate through the next, through this century. They all show that it's going to continue to warm. What happens to an ice cover when it gets warm? It melts. It's actually, it's not, I, you know, I, I am a kind of a fundamental kind of gal, and I like the fact that I'm doing work in an environment where if it warms up, it goes away. If it gets cold, it grows. So anyways, because of the fact that we expect things to warm, we expect the trends that we see, the loss of the ice, to continue through the century. Thirdly, current and projected changes that we're seeing in the Arctic environment, they have immediate consequences, they have broad consequences, and they have far-reaching consequences. And we'll talk about those consequences today. And finally, so that you're not all depressed over what's going on in the Arctic, uh, really, you're looking at a dynamic environment. And this dynamic environment presents all kinds of opportunities for innovative solutions. For the engineers among us, we create infrastructure systems that are based on a stable environment. So right there, you have a dynam dynamic environment where you're trying to cope with uh, infrastructure that's built for a steady state situation. So there's one great big thing there. The Arctic is this really interesting place societally because of the fact that you have an Arctic basin that's ringed by eight countries. And those countries don't always agree on everything. 
but they are trying to find peaceable solutions to points where there is disagreement. So it's not just engineers that have things to do, it's folks that are, you know, working on all kinds of different things. So again, that's the points that I hope you take away, and I hope you won't go to sleep now that you know what I want to say, but you'll listen to why these, uh, why I, like I said, believe that the Arctic is a uh, ground zero in a warming climate. So as uh, they would say in the sound of music, let's start at the very beginning. If I was a better singer, I'd sing that to you, but anyways, I'll spare you. Um, here what we're looking at is the global temperature. And the way that it's plotted, uh, we're looking at a temperature anomaly. So basically what they've done is over this time period, so from more than a century, starting in the late 1800s to current days, they looked at all the data that they can collect at all the different meteorological stations around the world, popped it into a bin, shaken it up, and gotten the average temperature. Okay, and that's what, oops, that's what this zero point is right here. And then what they do is they take every year and they look at what the temperature was at that year. And that's what each of these individually plot. And you're looking over time and you can see that things go up and down, but they in general have been going up over time and in particular, since 1980, there's been a general increase in temperature, general warming trend. If we look at the Arctic, we see the very same pattern. You can see the same dips, the climbs, and this general increase since 1980. As with most things, the devil's in the detail, though. What I want to draw your attention to is the magnitude along this scale. You can see global temperatures uh, recently are over the mean by about a degree. In the Arctic, they're over the mean by two degrees. Okay, this is what we call Arctic amplification. I hope it will become painfully clear to you while we're talking today what Arctic amplification means and why it's happening. And again, I'll stress one thing that's neat or unique about the polar environments, they are icy places and ice is not hold up well in a warming environment. So the big question is, what's the impact of the warming? Well, we're going to go back to what I like the best, and that's Arctic sea ice cover. It's what I've spent my career doing and um, studying. And here you can see a wonderful satellite photograph of the Arctic sea ice cover. OK, what are we looking at here? Alaska, exactly. I can tell that this is a summer picture of the Arctic sea ice cover. Here's the Arctic sea ice cover. It's pulled away from the shoreline in the summertime, so it's melted back towards the, the central basin. And points that I want you to understand about the Arctic sea ice cover. As we talked about, it's a frozen ocean. Um, it's very different from the land ice that Mary does her work on primarily. Uh, it is salty. Sea ice, uh, sea water is about 34 parts per thousand. Sea ice is about three or four parts per thousand. It loses a lot of its ice, but not all of its ice, or salts, excuse me. Land ice is fresh. Um, it is, as I've already tried to, to get across to you, a floating and moving ice sheet. It's extremely dynamic. It is meters thick. By uh, comparison to other ice covers on the planet, this is a very thin veneer of ice. The glacier ice on land, those are, meter, or those are miles, hundreds, thousands of feet thick. Uh, Arctic sea ice cover in the course of one winter will grow to be about two to three meters thick, six to nine feet thick. Still sounds pretty thick, but relatively speaking, not so much. It's highly reflective. You can see that in the picture here. It's bright and it's white. It sends sunlight back to space, helping to keep the planet cool. One interesting thing about the Arctic sea ice cover, when it melts, it's replaced by ocean. And we'll talk about this later. That's a highly um, absorbing uh, surface, and it warms things up. Finally, it is an integrator of heat. And this is a fancy way of saying what I've been saying along. When the ice cover gets warm, it melts. When it cools down, it grows. It integrates heat that's delivered to its top surface and heat that's, that's delivered to its bottom surface. And for these reasons, the Arctic sea ice cover is a co key component of the global system and a sensitive indicator of change. <coughs> and it makes it very interesting to study. 
So let's look at what's happening to the Arctic sea ice cover recently. We can use satellites to look at what's gone on with the sea ice cover um, starting in 1978. Satellites do a fantastic job of monitoring changes in the area and extent of the Arctic sea ice cover. They let us see how much it's grown and how much it's pulled back. They do this whether it's polar night, polar day, cloud cover, doesn't matter. And this is a story satellites tell us. First off, they let us see the impact of warming just if we look at one particular annual cycle, just one season. And what we see in the season is that in February, March time frame, the Arctic sea ice cover is as large as it gets during the year. It's been polar night, it's been cold, it's grown to its maximum extent. Here you're looking at the sea ice cover in the good old days, 1982. And the purple line that you're seeing around the outside in all these figures is the mean ice cover starting in 1978 to uh, year 2000. Okay, when we sh fast forward and, oops, didn't mean to fast forward that much. When we fast forward into September, the end of the summertime, we see the ice cover at its smallest extent. This is the sea ice minimum. And what you can see is the sea ice cover during the summertime pulls back from its periphery into its core. Okay, and basically the aerial extent varies by a factor of two between the winter and the summertime just because of the heat changes in the uh, annual cycle. But what we're going to do now is look at how the ice cover has changed both in its minimum extent and its maximum extent over time. First, we're going to look at the summertime. So what we're looking at here is from year to year, what was the area of the ice cover during its minimum extent in the summertime. And right here on the left-hand side, this is what the ice cover looked like in September of this year. So just a couple months ago. And again, this line is the same as I mentioned before. This is the average ice cover extent if you look from 1978 to 2000. And here you can see over time each year plotted, 1978 to current day. And like I said, this is why I like my job. These are observations. This cannot be disputed. And what you see undeniably is some bouncing around, but overall you see a very dramatic downward trend. And the downward trend right now is at a rate of about 12% per decade. 2007, look at these recent years, the lowest ice cover on record. While we've had satellites, you can see this huge drop here in 2007. There's six and seven, big, big drop. Got the attention, a lot of news coverage as a result of this. <coughs> There was some expectation that the ice cover might rebound, that this was just a fluke. And actually what you can see is that's not the case. It's bounced around, but it's stayed pretty low. Each of the last five years are the lowest five years on record. And in fact, in 2011, just a few months ago, we reached the second lowest record. And if you look at 2011, it's 31% below the 1979 to 2000 average. So what we're seeing is this, there's been a precipitous drop in the area of the ice cover in the summertime, and that drop has persisted with time. Now, it's a little hard to get your head around what 31% decrease means. So we're going to uh, compare, and those of you, the Eigert students probably actually saw this slide with Don. I'm borrowing from him. Um, it, around the outside here, the red is the, the ice cover in the September of 1980. The white is September of 2007. It's a dramatic change. It still might be hard to get your head around how much change there is. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that in 1980, the size of the ice cover was about the size of the continental United States. And if we look at it that way, this is how much ice was lost. Alaskans really like this slide, by the way. They have no trouble with the idea that we would just melt away the lower 48, as they call it. <laughs> and then they wouldn't have to wonder about whether they could get all the money they need for uh, uh, dealing with climate change. But you can see that this amount of ice loss is equivalent to losing all of the states east of, Missi of the Mississippi, a line of states up the western side of the Mississippi, and then some. It's a dramatic change. So that's what's been happening in the summertime. Let's look at what's happening in the wintertime when we reach the maximum extent. Here is March 2011, last winter. 
And what you can see is there's also a downward trend here. Now, the one thing I do want to point out, a lot of people will be talking about an ice-free Arctic Ocean. When we talk about that, we're talking about the summertime. The wintertime, we expect there to be an ice cover still, and you can see that here. I mean, we've got very, very low summer ice extent, but you still see ice in the wintertime. And what you can see, it's got a downward trend, but the trend is much, uh, much less pronounced. It's about 3% per decade. Um, and that's easier to see if I plot them together. Here in the red is the minimum extent over time, and this is the uh, maximum extent. Both downward trends, some are much more pronounced. Now, you might be saying, well, this is just 30 years. Woohoo. Um, we have done our best, scientists and researchers, to dig back through the annals and collect information from um, uh, observations, individual observations. Ships have provided a great amount of information here. And so what we're looking at here is changes in the sea ice cover. Um, this, the black is annual, the green is summer extent, and the, let's see, the winter is the blue up top here. But what you can see is, this is now from 1900 forward, is the changes that we're seeing in the Ar Arctic ice cover recently are in fact unprecedented for at least a century, and I guarantee you more centuries. Now, satellites do a great job of monitoring changes in the aerial extent of the ice cover. They don't do such a good job of measuring changes in the thickness of the ice cover yet. That's an area of very active research. They're trying to get a direct measurement of thickness. Right now, the estimates that they can come up with is about uh, plus or minus 50 centimeters. So in the meantime, while we're waiting for that research to take place, um, what we do is we use proxies for ice thickness, and that is the age of the ice cover. Okay, now the Arctic Basin, as I've already mentioned, is a closed basin. The way it circulates is ice moves around in the basin for multiple years, potentially. The longer ice is in the basin, the thicker it gets. So again, it allows us to say, proxy, that basically older ice is thicker ice. So what we do is we monitor how long ice is residing in the basin. And this is look at March 1980, then 2009, 10, and 11. And basically white here means that the ice is five years old or older. And the blue means that it's one year. So when you're looking at that, this is one year old, this would be two year old ice. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, and what you can see is dr dramatic change, not only in the extent of the ice cover, but in its age. Look at how much older ice was in the basin in March, uh, late, uh, around 1990. And around 2000, the same time that you saw the precipitous drop in the extent of the ice cover, we also saw a precipitous drop in its age. And it continues to be very young. And one thing, you could imagine a thinner ice cover is more vulnerable to warming temperatures. Okay, it is going to be hard for this ice cover to recover. So our job as researchers is not just to observe what's going on, it's to understand what's going on. Because as much as I might have poo-pooed models at the beginning, <coughs> models are really the only way we get to look in the future. And the better that we understand the processes that are driving the changes that we see now, the better we can build those models to give us more accurate forecasts in the future. It's basically how we've watched our weather forecasts get better over time. They've gotten better over time because two things, we have more information going into the models and we understand the processes better. So we're trying to achieve that same thing in the Arctic. In this particular case, the question we're asking ourselves is why do we have the dramatic loss of the sea ice cover? And there are a, a lot of um, suspects. Warmer air temperatures, a uh, longer melting season, uh, just more time for the ice to melt, winds that are actually blowing the ice cover out of the Arctic Ocean, um, warm ocean water coming up into the basin and melting the ice cover, clouds, and also solar heating of the ocean. And what we've done, uh, researchers in kind of my field, are develop instruments and models to delineate these various um, potential causes. And what I want to do now is to 
talk to you just very briefly about work that we've done at Krell to uh, add to the ability to understand what's going on and what we found. At Krell, we've developed these things called ice mass balance buoys. And they are autonomous drifting platforms. So that means that we get them deployed, we drill holes, we put them into the ice cover, and then they drift around with that moving ice. And the autonomous part is that once we leave them off, we never go back to get them. They send data to us uh, via satellite. The guy that I work with, a poor person <laughs> has to work with me, gets seven messages every hour from the buoys that are out right now <laughs> reporting data. <laughs> he's not here today <laughs> because he's home looking at the data. <laughs> he's like, have a good time at your talk, <laughs> particularly since AGU is coming up, because you can imagine it's a flurry. OK, buoy number 2011B, could you please get me that data? Um, and we have designed um, buoys for the thick ice and also buoys for the thinner ice. This proud papa, some of you may uh, recognize, is Chris Poloshensky. Uh, we were really upset with him, the fact that he didn't do his profile like this. Because if you noticed, it would have made a much nicer picture because he would have looked like the buoy that he helped design. This is actually, Chris uh, graduated this past summer and is now uh, on our Krell team with us. But anyways, I'll put that back there for fond memories. Um, what these buoys do, they're designed to do, is they monitor changes in the ice thickness. And what we do, these buoys are designed to live multiple years. And here you can actually see the ice cover growing and melting back over multiple annual cycles. So these buoys provide us information about surface temperature, air temperature, snow depth changes, ice growth and melt, and upper ocean temperatures. And again, just through a quick cycle, here you can see these buoy, this buoy was deployed in September. Um, you can see the winter. Finally, the temperature begin to propagate, the cold temperatures propagate towards the bottom. You get ice growth. Summer comes on. You can see the warm temperatures increase. The ice begins to melt, grows back the next uh, winter. You can see snow on the surface growing and then melting. So again, you get to see not only the fact that the ice covers is changing in its thickness, but importantly, you get to see how it's changing. And this is why it's not a thickness buoy, it's a mass balance buoy. So we get to understand whether the changes are occurring because of forcing at the surface of the ice cover or at the bottom of the ice cover. And when you need to understand what's going on, you need pieces of information like that. You need to know whether it's being forced atmospherically or oceanically. A thickness measurement alone will not tell you that. You have to have data like this. Now, putting one data out, or one buoy out, is not good enough. We like to put them out in clusters. And uh, here you can see a lot about the politics of the Arctic Ocean. Notice <laughs> that none of our buoys are over in Russia. <laughs> we're working on that. But here you can see are the buoys that were out in the summer of 2008. In the background, you're looking at the ice cover um, in, the in the summer of 2008 and the distribution of the buoys. The little white dots are actually where our buoys were. What, you, what we like to do is to be able to look at the network of buoys so that we can compare and contrast what's going on in each of the buoys. And here you're getting to see the red is the surface melt at each of these buoys, and the yellow is the bottom melt. And there's variability, but one thing that pops out at you is if you look around the edges, particularly this one, there's greater melt near the ice edge. So we wonder why. Well, um, working with Don, we get to look at solar heating. But actually, this is a good thing that we looked at solar heating. What you see here in these two plots, this is the amount of surface melt at each of these seven buoys, and this is the amount of bottom melt at each buoy. Here, we compare the amount of surface melt to the amount of solar heat that was delivered to the ice surface, OK, to see how it compared to the amount of melting. In the bottom, we looked at the amount of heat that was delivered to the bottom of the ice cover through the ocean. And what you see is there's somewhat of a relationship here, but it's not great. But there is a wonderful relationship. I mean, you just you live for these kind of relationships when you're doing research. I mean, you know, this is just like correlation factor where you're running around the hallways going, whoa, look at what I just found out. They don't happen very often, mind you, <laughs> which is why we all get excited about that. 
Uh, so it basically shows us that we have a strong linkage between bottom mount and solar heating of the up upper ocean. And that that amount of heat that's getting delivered to the bottom of the ice cover, it depends on where you are sitting in the ice cover. If you're near the edge, you can imagine that a lot of heat is being absorbed by the ocean and delivered underneath the bottom. If you're up around the North Pole, not so much. Because basically you've got an ice cover that's blanketing the ocean and it's not allowing the heat to get in. Okay, so let's back off and start looking at this as a system. Here we can see the ice cover. I've changed a year, but this story kind of stays the same. 2010. Okay, and notice where the ice cover is. It's drawn back from the coastal regions. If we look at that, we can compare that to data that's come in on the temperature of the upper ocean in the Arctic sea ice cover and how it's varying from average. These warm temperatures mean that the ocean is relatively warm. Here you can see the outline of the same ice cover. This is why I tilted this so that you can see that they're in the same orientation. And what you can see, here we have open water. Here we have relatively warm ocean. Here we have open water. We have relatively warm ocean. All right? Now we can advance our understanding if we begin to also look at the warm surface temperatures, the air temperatures, at the same time of year. And basically, we can see open water, warm ocean, warm atmosphere, relatively speaking. Um, and I can so warm, uh, not so warm there, but warm here. Anyways, you can begin to see connectivity. And what you begin to see here is that these are not individual observations. You're looking at observations that represent what's going on in an Arctic system. They are connected. They are not isolated events. One thing affects the other. And this is why we see these compacting, compounding impacts that lead to what we call Arctic amplification. It begins to feed back. Right at the center of this is this little puppy called albedo. OK, I know the Eigert students had to hear about albedo. All right? Tell, somebody tell me what albedo is. Because now I guarantee you, I lived for years without really knowing what an albedo is, and I was just too afraid to ask. So I'm not going to ask people who don't know, but I'm going to explain what it is real quickly. Because this concept is right at the center of why the Arctic is ground zero in a warming climate. What's the albedo? What does it measure? The reflectivity of a surface. Right. OK, so it's basically, it's pretty easy to understand. I was really sad that it took me so long to understand this, because it's a really nice uh, parameter. Um, the albedo is this little fraction of the amount of sunlight that's coming in and the amount of sunlight that's being reflected. And basically, what you see is what you get. So if this is uh, if it's a bright and white surface, all the amount of sunlight that's coming in is reflected. So what's the ratio going to be? One. Right, exactly. If it's a perfectly black surface, this is zero. So what's the ratio going to be? Zero. That bounds the problem. So basically, the albedo varies between zero and one. And honestly, if you look around the room and I pointed to something and you gave me albedo and then I came in with an, an instrument to measure albedo, you'd be surprised at how well you did. It really is a, a very visual um, measurement of the reflectivity of the surface, and our eyeballs pick that up. Now, in the Arctic, it so happens that we have the highest and the lowest albedos on the planet. Ice covers provide us with the highest albedo. Nothing's perfect, um, but their albedo is up about 0.85. The ocean, on the other hand, is one of the most absorbing surfaces on the planet. It's dark and it's black. Its albedo is down around 0.05. So basically, as I mentioned earlier, you replace this ice cover with the ocean as it melts away, and you suddenly have changed things on their head when it comes to the Arctic. You've taken this thermostat and turned it from cool to warm. Yep? Are there oceans that are darker than other areas? Oceans are the darkest, huh? But are there actually areas of the ocean that have different albedo? Yes, they would. If you look at, um, like, around coastal regions, if you looked from space, you'd see around coastal regions where it's a little bit shallow and you might still see a reflection off of the bottom, you would see that that was a lower albedo, a higher albedo, higher albedo than in the middle of the ocean. So, yeah, you would see a change. Yep? 
the, um, the solar energy, uh, the heat of solar energy is not in the visible range of wavelengths. Do you know whether this measurement is visible light only because the next 100 nanometers of energy is heat? You can then I'll be Sorry, sorry. You can do albedo in a couple ways. You can do albedo, kind of the integrated albedo, which is what I'm talking about, or you can do a spectral measurement of albedo where you're looking at the, the changes in wavelength. So the measurements I'm talking about are the integrated um, albedo. I know that white paper absorbs a lot of heat because most of the energy of the sun heat-wise is beyond visible. And it will, I mean, basically if you go in up to the Arctic in the summertime, you will see melt ponds on the ice cover and that sort of thing because it is absorbing sunlight. It does not absorb sunlight nearly as efficiently as a dark surface, though. I mean, if you put a, th you know, if you measure a white paper and a dark paper under light, you might feel the white paper is warm, but you're going to feel the dark paper is hot. So we get into this feedback, another one of these ways that things accelerate. We get absorbed sunlight. That causes the ice cover to melt, as I've already mentioned. That causes the albedo to get lower. If you look at a surface that's melting, it gets darker. It starts absorbing more sunlight. You get more melting, lower albedo, and you get this very strong positive feedback cycle. And this will cause, again, a system that's kind of humming along to suddenly accelerate as it begins to kick in. Now, when I've been focusing on the observations of the sea ice cover, I don't want you to think that this is the only piece of evidence that shows that the Arctic is ground zero in a warming climate. There's plenty of other observations. And the Arctic report card, if any of you want to see that, it comes out on the 1st of December. You can see a lot of them. Oh, what we see, for instance, is we see that there's a greening of vegetation in the Arctic. Okay, in particular, we see the greening around the coastal regions. That's where the maximum amount of greening is occurring. It is no coincidence that that greening is along the coastal regions where you are getting the loss of the sea ice and things are warming up. You will also see, if you look at permafrost temperatures, that they have generally been increasing. And they're increasing most dramatically if you're, again, at the coastal regions. So you, again, nothing in isolation. These changes are driving a lot of different things. And then you look at Greenland, and what you can see from Greenland uh, here is the fact you're looking at the number of uh, days that there was melt. And what you can see, the hottest colors are, are the um, extension of those melt periods. And what you can see, dramatically longer melt periods in Greenland at its lower elevations. Still around the surface, at the very top at summit, it's still cold, but not so much around the edges. Here's a pop quiz question for you. Which does glacier ice or sea ice cause changes in sea level? Only glaciers. Huh? Only glaciers. Glaciers only. Right? There's a little experiment that you can do to convince yourself of this. If you go home and you fill a cup with ice and water to its very brim, which would be an analogy of the uh, sea ice cover, and it melts, it's not going to overflow. Basically, that ice is already floating in the water. One astute student the other day said it'll actually be lower than the, than the top students, a good, a good eighth grader, because of the fact that the ice has expanded, and it'll be less. So I was like, he got bonus points. <laughs> He didn't have to stay in the ice in the cold room as long as the rest of the students. <laughs> yeah. These are relative to the 1880 values. Uh, which ones? The, Sorry. All the heat map I believe the plus 40 days and plus 80. You know, you caught me. I did not. Um, I did. I didn't pick up the the uh, the amount. I don't. I really. I don't know what it's compared to. I expect that it's probably compared to the. This is from satellite records again, so this is probably compared from 1980 forward. Is that about right? Yeah. So the last 30 years. It's, it's dramatic. Like I said, these changes are subtle. So it really doesn't take, you know, much to convince people. You might argue why it's happening, but it's hard to argue that it is happening. 
And, uh, and then the, as filling, finishing the analogy, if you, took a, if you took a cup full of water and you put a piece of ice on the table and it dripped in, it would overflow. So that's, that's the difference between glaciers. Fun to do. I mean, you know, Friday night, what else are you going to do? <laughs> Remember me on Friday night when you're doing the ice cube experiment. So the question then with these changes is what's the road ahead? Again, all of the models that we have out there predict continued warming. And in continued warming, we're going to continue to see loss of the ice cover. In the case of the ice cover, many of the models that we have, including those done by Marika Holland at uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, would suggest that in the summer, middle of the century, which you guys will be around to see, that routinely we will have an ice-free Arctic in the summertime. Again, in the summertime, not all summer long, but a good portion of the summer, it will be ice-free. This changes things up dramatically. And so, we expect this to happen because we have continued warming. Here you're actually seeing projections that were in the last IPPC report, International Panel on uh, climate, or no, what's the other P for? Policy, uh, or no, it's IPCC, isn't it? Ah, sorry, International Panel on Climate Change. <laughs> and uh, these were the, this was the last report. It's just getting updated and will come out again. And what you're seeing are projections um, up to the quarter century and then the end of the century. And you can see warming all over the place. You will continue to see that the Arctic region is getting walloped more than anything else. Okay, the expectation is that through the end of the century, temperatures at the Arctic will increase 4 to 8 degrees centigrade. Again, not good if you're an ice cube. Okay, so continued warming, continued melting. We've got this relatively thin ice cover. It's very vulnerable to melting. And finally, we have these things like ice albedo feedback that help accelerate the warming. So this is why we feel confident. We might not know the date exactly. There's pools out there that you can join. Um, but um, we, betting pools that is, um, not swimming pools, betting pools you can join um, if you're young enough. For those of us that are older, we're not allowed to enter in because, <laughs> well, our children might like it if we did and then willed our winnings to them. But uh, anyways, uh, that we'll have a, a routinely ice-free Arctic in the summertime. I, I don't, you know, I don't, I, there, I'm, I'm, I'm into quality living. <laughs> I want to know what's happening to the Arctic ice cover, not not knowing and still being around. So one thing I want you to, we're just going to stop here for a moment. I want you to look at the picture of the Arctic sea ice cover in the summer of 2010. And I want you to look now, we've been talking a lot about the area receding, it's getting thinner. Look at where it's happening. Okay, and routinely it happens around the periphery. And basically what's going to happen is this is going to get smaller and smaller to eventually work itself back here to uh, north of Greenland in the Canadian archipelago because that's where the very thickest ice cover is. Okay, you tell me. Let's name some things you think that are being affected because of how this ice cover is changing. Well, I'll write them down. <laughs> See if you get these. See if I miss some. What do you think? Weather. Huh? Weather. Weather? Yeah. Holiday. Let's let's do marine mammals in general. How about that? Shipping routes. Yeah. What else? People. People? Yeah. What else? Resource extraction. You guys are going to make my job easy. Thank you. This means I'll be able to show you pictures of what it's like to be in an Arctic ice camp. Primary productivity. Pardon? Primary productivity. Yeah, fisheries resources. Yeah. Anything else? One other thing that I thought of that you guys didn't think of. Tourism. Oh, tourism. There's two things. <laughs> yeah, and I just probably put chalk on my butt. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. It's a bad habit. Infectious <laughs> diseases. Diseases. 
I did not think of that one, but it is true. Birds? Bird? Bird. <laughs> Hitchcock. <laughs> oh, birds. Anything else? A lot is affected by these changes. And like I said, these aren't things that are being affected in the future. These are things that are being affected now. Okay? Marine mammals. Okay, right off the bat. These sea ice covers an integral part of the lives of these, these uh, marine mammals. You'll hear a lot about the polar bears. The polar bears depend on the sea ice cover for hunting and raising their young. Um, and or tend to be the poster animal, if you will, for the Arctic. <coughs> Actually, what's having a more hard time are the walruses. The walruses um, are bottom feeders. They dive and use their tusks to bring up shellfish, and they eat them. One of the problems that's happening with the walruses is they sit around. They're big animals. They're kind of, you know, they eat and they lay around. So they like to have sea ice where they can float around in shallow waters. As the ice cover recedes in the summertime, those edges are in deep water. That means that these walruses are beginning to what they do call haul out. That means get out of the water on land rather than sea ice. There's a whole lot less land than there is sea ice. And as a result, there's a lot of kill going on with the baby walruses. When these guys get agitated, they run. And you know, it doesn't make any difference if there's a baby there. Um, interesting, uh, uh, in putting, the one thing that's neat for me to put in together the Arctic Report Card is I hear a lot about things that I wouldn't otherwise probably read. Um, but uh, the bowhead whale, there's uh, bowhead whales that are in the Bering Strait, and there's bowhead whales that are over on the uh, west coast of Greenland. And this year, for the first year, they saw tagged bowhead whales from the Pacific pod and the Atlantic pod in the same place at the same time. So things like that are beginning. Before, what would happen is the ice in the Canadian archipelago would prevent them from interacting. Um, so marine mammals. And I think somebody mentioned primary productivity. Now, at, the marine mammals are up at the top. And the primary productivity is at the bottom. It's the foundation of the food web in the Arctic, which isn't terribly complicated. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward food web. And again, in the report card, work that's been done by uh, Karen Frey at Clarkson University and, and her colleagues shows that if you look at the loss of sea ice cover here on the left, where you're seeing, again, the ice cover gone in the uh, Chukchi Beaufort area, excuse me. Um, in the Kara Sea region, you can map that to places where you're seeing increased productivity. Again, because of the fact that you're losing the ice edge routinely. So it's beginning to impact the food web all over the place. There, and we could also talk about ocean acidification too. Um, basically, um, the um, uh, oceans are becoming more acid, which is bad for uh, critters that like to grow shells. With that slide, is there anything positive that comes out of that? Yeah. Pro primary productivity, yeah, more, f more for critters to eat. Now, they're changing in, in their characteristics. There's something called the Atlantification of the Arctic Ocean, meaning that species are kind of coming north. So it's not, it's not negative. It's just that there's a change. It's a complicated change. How it's going to impact, nobody really knows. But two things to take away. It is, again, it's not a very complex food web. So things happen down here. It doesn't take long before they impact higher um, levels in the food web. But it just means that it's going to change. OK, whoops. Hey, I had these nifty little circles to show you what I just explained. This is the one point that wasn't brought up. And this is the whole issue of sovereign rights and, and uh, um, who owns what in the Arctic. Again, as I mentioned earlier, when you look at the Arctic, it's this basin and it's surrounded by eight different countries. And those countries have regional, national, and there's also global interests. And they aren't all the same, but they really are making an effort to try to um, uh, deal with disagreements 
peaceably. The Arctic's really different from the Antarctic. There is no treaty in place to, um, to make people do certain things. There is what's called the Law of the Sea, which is a UN um, effort which the United States has, refuses to sign on to for reasons that themselves make uh, for an interesting study. But in, in the Law of the Sea, you're basically able to make claims. And right here, this is just an example of one dispute. This is how much of the Arctic the Russians say that it's theirs. And right now, that claim is on the table. I think there's 10 years it takes for a claim until uh, countries get to vote on that claim. The US, again, because it's not ratified, this is not able to vote. And you also remember why we all talk about things being all peaceful and everything. You remember the Russians planting their flag on the Lomonosov Ridge right here at the North Pole, just to say they could. There's also an interesting dispute in the Canadian archipelago. If you look at this region, Canada, for some crazy reason, thinks that this is their waters, their territories, which actually, if I were Canadian, I'd think that that was my territory too. The rest of the countries like to think this is international waters. So that's just another thing with our next door neighbors. One other thing to remember is the fact that among the Arctic nations, it includes the United States. I really wish Letterman would go out on the street and ask people whether or not the US was an Arctic nation. I honestly, you would hear most people say, no, no, it's not. Because they forget about Alaska. And why Alaska likes that sometimes, they don't like it when it comes to legislation and stuff. So this is a big issue. Uh, we had, uh, somebody mentioned the potential for s northern sea routes. Um, really, a lot of people talk about, get really excited about the Northwest Passage, which will come through uh, the Canadian archipelago. Really, the first passage that will open up routinely, and you could take this to the bank, is uh, the northern sea route. And this is the route that, uh, a, a much shorter route from Europe to Asia over the Arctic. In fact, the, there are a few ships that are traveling that every year now. Um, the the uh, Russians insist that they have an icebreaker. They're making, they're, they're happy with this. They might make some money. And Lloyd's of London is also studying this. And when they start studying something, that means it's probably going to happen. Uh, re resource recovery, certainly, um, as the Arctic uh, loses some of its teeth, um, we're looking at an opportunity for um, not only oil and gas, there's a lot of minerals up there that can be recovered as well. Um, increased tourism. Okay, everybody might be scared of the oil and gas industry, but honest to Pete, this is where people expect there's the highest potential for a maritime catastrophe. And the reason is, if you talk to oil companies, even though the deep water horizon just happened, they are risk adverse. They do not want bad things to happen. Guess what tourist ship gets paid for? More money, the bigger the risk. So these guys are going up into the Arctic because they can. And again, the Arctic Basin is a clo closed basement. You get ice, one minute it could be ice free, the next minute it's not ice free because the winds have shifted. And these ships that go up there are not ice hardened, a lot of them. In fact, a few years ago there was a tourist ship in Antarctica that got a hole punched in it. Uh, fortunately, uh, there was another ship close by that people could come and rescue the, the folks on that ship. So this is where the expectation that there's probably going to be the first catastrophe, which would involve um, the loss of oil and gas off the ship, but also the potential, unfortunately, of loss of life. Because there are, it's hard for the Coast Guard to get to even know that there's a ship here, let alone get to them if they have a problem. And we mentioned people. The Arctic is unique from the Antarctic in the fact that it is home to people, home to about 4 million people. I think that's about the right number. Is that right, Ross? Uh, give or take. Um, and a uh, number of those people are, are indigenous. They've lived there forever. They've built their way of life around the polar region. I think this is just a great group of photographs, so I'll linger on it for just a moment. Oops. <laughs> I have a problem with lingering these buttons. It's getting late. OK, this is a, a picture of a, um, uh, a native who is actually hunting. And uh, basically, you're seeing they're blind here. They're trying to trick the whale so that they can't uh, see this person who's standing here in white. Just looks like another chunk of ice. Uh, here you can actually see uh, 
a whale being hunted. You see the blowhole here. Um, this is kind of cool. I was in Barrow, Alaska. I didn't obviously take these, but I saw this, uh, where they have the blanket tosses uh, <laughs> celebrating a uh, excellent whaling season. Yeah, I always thought this was easy until I got close by. These things are only about 15 feet wide, and they're going 30, 40 feet in the air. I mean, this is, and they're throwing candy around and stuff like that. I saw kids learning how to do this, and one kid fell off. That was, I mean, it was Darwinian. And here you can see uh, some uh, uh, women in the, uh, actually using the, the skins. Um, this is long skin, so it's probably going to be used for a boat or something. So, this, you know, I, I, we used to say that the, um, the native population was, or were canaries in the coal mine. And I got my, my hat handed to me when I said that around Richard Glenn, a native Alaskan, and said, we are not a canary in the coal mine. We will figure out how to adapt, but they're not happy about having to figure out how to adapt. So don't say that in the wrong company. I've taken it out since. <laughs> I don't say that anymore. And finally, if we keep thinking about the fact that, oh, well, it's all up there, you know, yeah, it kind of affects us, uh, oil, gas, blah, 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 blah. Um, we are beginning to see direct connections with regard to somebody mentioned weather. And over here on the left, I don't want to get into the details of this, but look at the pretty colors. Um, basically, you're looking at the Arctic circulation pattern. This is December, um, the, av the general pattern from 1981 to 2010. Okay, you see these nice purple lows in the, uh, that are in the Arctic, and this is driving the winds. The winds are going whoo, around these purple lows. December 2009, see how these lows broke up? The way these lows are positioned allowed cold air from the Arctic to come down into the uh, northeastern United States. And if you remember, Washington shut down for a while. It's not all bad. So, uh, but anyways, we're seeing uh, what we believe to be direct link linkages between Arctic uh, um, systems and lower latitudes. And also, you'll note that when cold air comes down here, warm air goes up into the Arctic. So there's an exchange. It's all balanced. It just doesn't disappear. So here you can actually see where Greenland got really hot during the wintertime, relatively speaking. So, summary, from a polar bear's perspective, um, things are not that great, you know, from, from a polar bear. Uh, Arctic regions provide strong observational evidence of a warming climate. We expect the ice loss to continue in the face of projected warming. The impacts, I hope to have convinced you that they're immediate, they're broad, and they're far-reaching. Now, the good thing for people, as opposed to polar bears, is again, particularly for you students, this is a great opportunity to be part of the solution in all sorts of walks of life, engineer, sociologist, medical, somebody did mention diseases, there are definitely disease changes. Uh, there's a lot more suicides up in the Arctic. I mean, just all kinds of things that you can get involved in that will you know, help us adapt to the change and also mitigate changes. So that's the end before I roll into some pictures of sea ice for or a nice um, um, camp if anybody wants to stick around. But I'm happy to answer questions at this point if you have them for those that need to leave. Does anybody, do people want to see the ice camp pictures? It doesn't take very long. Yeah. Okay. Do you have questions you'd like to ask me right now? Yeah. What's the future for Crowell? Oh, yeah, good question. <laughs> right. <laughs> that collapsed the of the Cold War. Yeah, that was bad for business for us was the end of the Cold War. Um, we do a lot of reimbursable work. I mean, we have, obviously, I have continued to do this work even beyond that. I get funding from NSF, NOAA, NASA to continue doing work. The Department of, the De of Defense, we do not get any direct money to do cold regions Arctic work right now. I can say that the Navy um, among the DOD is concerned about their ability to respond and provide support to emergencies. Um, so, you know, I mean, the life cycle is a circle of life. It's kind of coming around. I think Krell will continue to be here. I think it will continue to be more diverse. 
Um, but in my last years, I'm working hard to try to uh, see that some funding from, for the Arctic comes back into Crow. And I don't, I don't think it's impossible. And I'm, you know, I'm not that far from retirement. I know you all might be surprised to hear that, but because of the preservation in the, uh, uh, in the cold rooms. But any other questions? Yeah. yeah I think your points, uh, several points, uh, point to like your own uh, health may be better than ours. Um, almost every item on your list, there is a. Here? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a, a positive opportunity for innovation, as you said, in a positive way. Yep. And I'd like to separate innovation and mitigation. Yep. Because the controversy that arises in this area all the time is many of us assume you're proposing that either the government or somebody change this result. If I took that list, the only one which is probably the least provable is weather change that, that isn't a positive. Mm -hmm. For instance, I came from Stanford, Connecticut. Long Island Sound was the lake left from glacier flow. And I think at the moment today, <coughs> Connecticut's a better place for most people to live in all those areas that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. Could you not take positives out of warming of the art other than weather change? Could I not take positives? Could you, could you take positives? Could I take there's positives? There's more fish. There's more fish. There's the, the um, opportunity to extract oil and gas in the Arctic region is seen as a positive by many, you know, less dependency because there's a lot of the, those oil and gas reserves are in the U.S., you know, on our own territories. I mean, it's debated. Some people don't think it's a positive. Many do. Um, so I, I don't mean to say that they're all negative. I just mean to say that they're changes. Um, and I think the one thing, though, that I would like to see is that there's some more government um, support of the innovation, of the effort to mitigate what's going on. And I mean, one of the nice things about getting to talk to groups like this is to inform them, because I don't think our government's going to do anything until the public demands it. It's just the way it works. So, uh, you know, I think having a more educated public will perhaps see funding lines. And again, I don't think I am going to retire before that happens. But, you know, potentially, you know, that's, that needs to happen as well. Just some pressure. Yeah. I think one of the issues, though, about what you're talking about is that while these changes occur in the Arctic, there will be changes in places like southern Sudan and Somalia where yep. they're going to be drought stricken. There's going to the be waters, places like Thailand there. that are yep. going to be underwater. Yep. And so, <laughs> It's kind of this whole shift in yep. kind of environmental paradigm. And so while there are positives in the Arctic uh, associated with kind of the melting of the Arctic, um, kind of the reflectance that the Arctic provides to our world is going to cause it to <coughs> warm up so much that maybe Connecticut is no longer a pleasant place to live. Yep. That's why I said I think the other side is obvious. The others are not necessarily negatives that need to be fixed for the Arctic itself. I got you. There are, in fact, tremendous opportunities to have I agree. a better life to those people. Right. No reason. This is not just about Sudan. This is about South and Central U.S. too. Right. Yep. I mean, look at the what's happened this summer with the droughts and everything like that. I mean, all over the world. I mean, really, water is the big thing. Now, the reason that it's nice to focus on the Arctic is, again, the observations. I mean, it is you cannot deny that something's going on up in the Arctic. People will argue whether droughts and that sort of thing are the f effect of climate change. You can't, you're, I mean, this is, this is linked to warming. So that's one reason that's advantageous to focus on the Arctic is this education thing again, is to get people to understand this is happening and it's happening now. It's not a projection. So that's one reason why I focus on the Arctic aside from the fact that that's what I do. When I, okay, before I lose everybody, that'd be quick. Okay, uh, Arctic Ice Camp. This is a, a Arctic Ice Camp that I was in in uh, 2007 in March. Um, it is was in the Alaskan Beaufort Sea, about 200 miles north of Prudhoe, which is equivalent of an hour and a half plane ride in a twin otter. No bathrooms, um, and it is at the edge of that thicker ice cover on relatively thick ice, as thick as you can get there. Um, here's what you see when you're flying into an ice camp. 
uh, there's this little dot on the horizon after an hour and a half. And if you look real closely, you see that that's the ice camp and here's the runway. Basically what they do is this is a place where the ice cover is broken up in the winter time and it's frozen over and hasn't deformed. It's nice flat. It looks like lake ice basically and the boom, plane puts itself right down there. Um, there usually is a backup runway in case the ice cover breaks. Um, and this is when you fly down into the uh, ice camp. This is what you see uh, is this mess of huts that uh, these are put up by the uh, University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. They have a group that does ice camp. And uh, these are the living quarters. This is the mess hall and this is command and control where you have all the radios. Robert knows these things well, don't you? Uh, getting around. Okay, this is to be the plane that you fly in um, into the camp. Um, if you're going about 100 miles from the camp, you get my personal favorite, helicopters. I love flying in helicopters. My husband does not love me flying in helicopters so much because they're like rocks that fall out of the sky when the blades stop going. <laughs> uh, but they're still fun. They're like an amusement ride. If you're going about 10 miles, you're out on a snowmobile. Um, and this is actually me in the Arctic. You can usually tell me I have a pink, I wear a pink band on my hat. And amazing, none of the guys have picking, picked up on this fashion forward look. So I'm usually easy to pick out. Uh, and then there's a lot of walking around. And actually you see us oohing and aahing. This is a, a crack in the ice cover. We're looking at the open ocean here. When you're out on the ice cover working, it doesn't take long before you forget that you are in a moving uh, ice cover. You kind of think that you're on stable land. And then one of these little puppies will happen. And you're reminded you've got about 10,000 feet of ocean underneath of you. Well, one big thing about the Arctic when you're in ice camp, you do not fall into one of these. You don't get wet there because you will turn into a human popsicle very quickly. The other thing is you're wandering away from camp. You want to make sure that you don't get on the other side of one of these and have them open up. And then you have to radio back and get one of these to come and get you. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, hello, I can't get back. Could you pick me up? Um, <laughs> Just not cool. And uh, this is everything that you, you uh, take out to a camp, you have to take yourself. This is an Arctic gas station. Uh, so all the fuel's brought out in barrels. And you, here you can see the pumps. You know, so you, you get to fill your own, even out in the Arctic. It's not like New Jersey, where they have servicemen. Um, and in from the cold, the mess hall is a great place. I mean, it's where everybody gathers. And here you can see us in the mess hall actually doing some work. Uh, the people that work the hardest in the camps are unquestionably the cooks. In this particular camp, there were three cooks. They are up at four in the morning and they go to bed. They fall in their beds at eight at nighttime. And they cook the most fantastic food. The saddest part about coming home from an Arctic ice camp is having to think about what I want to cook for dinner. <laughs> Honestly. So there's the kitchen. I mean, it is seriously tricked out. Um, and this is, so you walk in from the Arctic, you know, you've been out all day long and this is what greets you, you know, these breads that are just being made, it's, it's fantastic. And it tastes also good. I mean, you guys have been outside. I mean, how much better does food get than, you know, if you've been outside? Um, we have our, we bring our barbecue grills. I mean, we like to party. Uh, we do the little tricks with ice cubes and water. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> This is a walk-in freezer. So you walk along here and you'll find frozen steaks and shrimp and lobster tail. Um, this is how we get water. I mentioned that the sea ice cover is still salty. If it, if it stays, if the ice stays uh, repeatedly in the basin, it will eventually, the salt will leach out of the top and you'll actually have a fresh water source at the top of these high points. And it's everybody's job in the camp to chisel ice and make water. Um, it is a, a group effort to make water for general living. If you want to shower on your own, you go get your own ice. Guess so. not many people shower in the camp, but the good news is everybody smells bad. <laughs> I did come home from one camp trip one time. I got off the plane and my husband gave me a nice hug and he goes, did you sit by anybody in the plane? And I said, yeah, why? He goes, you do not smell good. <laughs> I was uh, really offended. Uh, and uh, anyways, um, home sweet home. The camps all look a bit the same from camp to camp, but they're all a little bit unique. Uh, in this particular camp, all of the huts were named after casinos. My camp, my hut was New York, New York. Um, and they're really, they're actually really quite cozy. This is the inside of a camp. This is actually my um, bunk right here. The, this particular hut, this size, 
uh, it was built for potentially eight people. We had four people in it, and it was comfortable with four. It would have been crowded with eight. But it's cozy. It's got a, uh, right here you can see um, some fuel here, a little stack right here. There's, it's heated. I mean, it's not, you know, so it's comfy. Um, here again you can see our heater. Uh, we'll melt ice there so you can take bird baths. And a question that everybody asks there is the outhouse. Uh, there are no magazines in this outhouse. You take care of business rather quickly. <laughs> move in, move out. They are not heated at all. At all, at all. So they try to turn them around so that the doors aren't facing into the wind so that you're sitting there and snow is just piling up on your unmentionable. Um, so anyways, the one thing about an ice camp, being out at an ice camp that I like the best is, I mean, people that do Arctic work, you don't do Arctic work if you don't like it. You don't go to the field. You go maybe once. So the people that are there are really happy to be there. So if you look at this picture, the one thing you see is a lot of good dental work. I mean, there are a lot of happy smiles. People are really pleased to be there. Um, me among them in the uh, pink hat. And I just will close. This is, a, this is another reason why I love to go to the Arctic. This is a picture in that ice camp uh, just before I was getting ready to leave. This is the last evening that I was here. This was out at about 11 o'clock at nighttime. And, um, I don't know, it may be a barren landscape, but I think it's an extremely beautiful landscape. I sound like it could be on TLC. <laughs> I had like eight children following behind me. So anyways, but uh, this, it's, uh, you know, not many people get to see it, and it is actually a real privilege to do polar research. No bugs and snakes either. I, that's another selling point. Yeah. Uh, how many sunny days versus cloudy days versus snow days? Is it the same, or is it It depends. If you're this time of year, which is March and April, a lot of sunshine. Um, you get into the summertime when you begin to get more water around and um, a lot of clouds. There's a lot of moisture in the air. Um, so sunny days, usually more in the wintertime and uh, early, in the late fall, cloudy a lot in the summertime. The thing to remember about this is the sunlight is increasing dramatically at this yeah. time. And the, the other thing that happened is we had one really bad day at the very beginning where it was blowing. Yeah, when it blows, and, yeah. When it blows, it's bad. It was about 20 below and blowing like that. Right. The blowing snow. But if it's not blowing, it's usually pretty nice outside. Um, and yeah, it's gaining by, what is it? I mean, it's like 20 minutes a day or something. I mean, you go into an ice camp for two weeks, and it's a completely different world from when you went in to when you went out. The winter times, I've had the opportunity to be up in the November, December time frame, so when it's going into polar night. Most amazing northern lights ever. The aurora is just gorgeous. And you can actually see a lot. A lot of people think of the polar night as being really dark. There's a lot of reflection from stars and moonlight. I mean, there's just a general glow. When we were out working, we actually, we started with headlights. We actually ended up taking our headlights off because, um, it, I, we felt it was safer, you know, we could see, you know, polar bears and stuff moving around easier if we didn't have a headlamp on. But you can see a lot. Yeah? Are you uh, rotating uh, clock, counterclockwise uh, the, the whole ice flow? In, uh, in the Beaufort Sea, um, okay, so here's the, if this is, this is the basin, and right here is um, Alaska, and this is uh, Russia. So here you have the Bering Strait, you know, where you're going into the Arctic. And so over here is Greenland. Very crude drawing. So this is the Fram Strait. Basically, there's two major circulation patterns in the Arctic. One is called the Beaufort Gyre. And the other is the transpolar drift. And basically where we are, we're in this particular area, we're in the Beaufort um, gyre. So we're typically moving kind of westward. Is that what you? A mile an hour, I think. Oh, it depends on the wind. I mean, it's, it, can be, um, it can be several miles an hour. Not enough to make your hair like blow, but uh, it makes it difficult. Uh, this past. March, I was up doing an experiment where we had a survey line that we set out to make in situ measurements of the thickness of the ice cover and the snow depth. 
And then we had these different planes that were instrumented to measure thickness flying over us. It, I mean, it's, it, you got to work hard because you're moving the whole time. You can see their flight patterns, and we were drifting noticeably. How do you keep your house from not sinking through the ice? And uh, you, t you trust that the folks putting the camp out are good at selecting an ice flow. You can actually see thicker ice because it's got a higher freeboard, so, and it also kind of looks melty on the surface. So I mean, that may sound stupid, but from a helicopter or something, you can pick out a thicker ice flow. So you pick those and hope that it doesn't. I mean, ice camps have certainly broken up. The Russians have an ice camp that they put out every year. And I think last summer, they actually had to be rescued out of it because it began broke, breaking up. So, but we're not there for very long. This, these camps are out for about a month. And we, I, we had an experiment where we did, uh, took measurements over the course of the year. In that case, we were in a ship to avoid just the problem that you're talking about. So, any other questions? Let's get Thanks very much. <laughs>